this is a very simplified drawing of an animal. <coughs> So we're going to talk about different parts of a cell, and we're just going to start by looking at this very, very simplified drug. When you look at this, I want you to notice is three things. Number one, there's a membrane, the cell membrane, that forms the border of the cell. Everything inside of that border is the cell, everything outside of that border is not the cell. Inside the cell, there's a very large nucleus. We'll talk about what's in the nucleus and what it does, but right now we're just looking at landmarks. You have the outside of the cell, the plasma membrane. When you look at it, you're going to see a nucleus. When we start looking at slides on microscopes, the nucleus is going to be the most prominent thing you're going to see. A plasma membrane is almost impossible to see under a microscope. You're going to look and you're going to see nuclei. Nuclei is the plural form of nucleus. And then out here we have the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm is everything else inside the plasma membrane that is not the nucleus, and it includes the yellow here, which is, we'll learn is the cytosol. It's just kind of a a water jelly substance. And then there is all of these other organelles. Organelles are little things in the cell that have specific purposes, but I like to break the cell down into three compartments. There is the plasma membrane, the nucleus, and then everything else. So let's start with that plasma membrane. We said it is the border between the cell and the outside world. That's the same thing as the cell membrane. Yes. yes. Cell membrane and the plasma membrane are the same thing. It is flexible. The difference between an animal cell and a plant cell is a plant not only has a plasma membrane, but it also has a cell wall. We are not dealing with cell walls this semester. This is a flexible membrane only. And so if you ever have a chance to look at live cells, under a microscope, you'll see that they can actually change shape and move. If you poke it, it will bulge. Okay? It will shrink, it will shrink and swell. The plasma membrane's main purpose is to control what gets into and out of the cell. We need to get nutrients into a cell. If we can't get nutrients into the cell, the cell will die. We need to uh, prevent invaders like pathogens, bacteria, viruses from getting in. If they do get in, the cell will die. We also need to prevent things from getting out. Once nutrients get in, we need to keep them from getting out. We need to keep the water in the cell to prevent it from drying out. We're, but at the same time, the cell is going to make toxins. As we metabolize sugars <coughs> to get energy out of them, we make things like lactic acid. Lactic acid is hazardous to a cell. The cell has to get rid of that. And so the plasma membrane has to allow the lactic acid to get out. The plasma membrane is also going to allow one cell to talk to another. If you have one cell here and one cell here, and they come in contact with each other, it's the plasma membranes that touch. The nuclei do not touch, the organelles inside do not touch. The plasma membranes touch each other. And so if this cell is going to tell this cell, hey, I'm here, it's going to do it through the plasma membrane. We say the plasma membrane and the cell membrane is selectively permeable. That's what I was talking about when I said that some things can get in, other things cannot. Some things can get out, other things cannot. It's selectively permeable. Permeable means able to get through. This is selectively permeable because some things can move through it, some things cannot. The 
plasma membrane or cell membrane is made up of what's called a lipid bilayer. So we'll, we'll see that on the next slide here. Part of that plasma membrane is nonpolar, and other parts are going to be polar. Nonpolar means hydrophobic, meaning things that do not like water. Hydrophilic or, or water soluble would be hydrophilic, so things that do like water. So here we see that cell membrane. We'll come back to the finish that other slide. So we learned about phospholipids last week. We said that this is a phospholipid, and it's made up of two parts. There's a head where the phosphorus is, and then there are two tails that come down. The head is hydrophilic, it likes water. The tails are hydrophobic, they do not like water. And so if we take a bunch of phospholipids and put them together in water, they form a structure that looks like this. We get two layers, and the tails that like each other but don't like water face each other. And the heads that don't like tails but do like water are going to face the outside. So when we look at this picture, what I want you to really pick out is we have our membrane here. The heads are facing outside. Outside is extracellular fluid, or that interstitial fluid. Just think of it as water. There's water outside of a cell, and there's <coughs> water on the inside of a cell. Water on the inside of a cell is called cytosol. Cyto means cell. And so the heads face water inside and outside the cell, and the tails face each other in the center. So because of that, this bilayer is not permeable to ions. Ions were charged. Ions were the things of positive or negative charge. Things that are ions are charged like water. So if you have an ion, a charge, it's out here, and it wants to be in here, it's going to have to pass through here. But it can't. It can't. So ions are stuck outside. We're going to have special mechanisms to allow them in. They cannot just cross the plasma membrane. It doesn't work that way. If you have a large molecule, like glucose or amino acids, those also cannot just go across the plasma membrane. These are packed in here pretty tight. If you have a big molecule, Imagine something like this, or like that. These are big molecules. Imagine that trying to get through there. You would really have to push a lot of these phospholipids out of the way, and it's not going to happen. Small things that are not charged can go through. Something small enough to wiggle itself between them, but also, like <coughs> this area here, can work its way through and basically nothing else can. So if it's only a very select group of things that can get across that membrane, we have to have other ways to get things across. Because we need to get things in, we need to get things out. And there are two ways we can do it, each with more kind of details that go with them. But on the surface, we can group them into passive processes and active processes. A passive process allows something to go where it wants to go. What we're going to see in this class a number of times is that things want to move from where they are high concentration to where they are low concentration. So they want, if they're someplace where there's a lot of things like it, they're going to want to go where there is very few things like it. We call that moving down its concentration gradient. High concentration to low concentration. So let's go back to this picture. Remember, this is the inside of the cell. This is the outside of the cell. Let's say that we have something 
let's say it's a whole bunch of sugar. It's a very high concentration of sugar outside of the cell. Things always want to go away from the high concentration. So if we have a bunch of sugar outside, that sugar is going to want to go inside. He said sugar can't just go across, but we'll learn that there are ways to allow it to. But sugar wants to go inside. That's the direction it wants to go. And so if we do come up with a way to allow it to do that, that is a passive process. We are just allowing sugar to do something that it wanted to do anyways. The opposite of that is an active process. Now let's imagine we have a whole bunch of sugar outside and a small amount of sugar on the inside. A bunch outside, a little bit inside. Which direction does the sugar want to go? It wants to go in. It wants to go in. If we have a bunch out and a little bit in, all the sugar outside wants to go in where there isn't any. But what we're going to do here is we're going to take the little bit of sugar that's inside and pump it out. Imagine water on top of a hill. The water wants to flow down the hill. You don't have to work very hard to let water do its thing and let gravity take it down the hill. But if you want to take water from the bottom of a hill to the top, you either need to carry it or you need to pump it. Whatever you do is going to take energy and work to make it happen. So if we're going to pump sugar from the inside to the out, from low concentration to high, that's called an active process. We're sending it up its concentration gradient, from low concentration to high. And it's going to take energy in the form of ATP to make it happen. And we'll learn a few different ways that we can do this. So that allowing something to go down its concentra concentration gradient, where it wants to go, the idea that something wants to go from high concentration to low is called diffusion. Diffusion is a passive process in whatever is moving, the, the atoms, the molecules, whatever it is, is going to move on its own. It is not going to get pumped. If I open a bottle of perfume in the back of the room, what's eventually going to happen to the smell at the front of the room? It's going to get tainted I'll be able to smell it up here, right? No one used a fan to blow that perfume up here. It got up here on its own. That is called diffusion. Same thing is happening in our bodies. Things are moving from high concentration in the perfume bottle to over here where it's a low concentration. There's none of it here now. Eventually it's going to slowly work its way from the back to the front. So areas of high concentration move to low concentration. But there's two types of diffusion, simple and facilitated. Simple diffusion is just allowing something to happen. There is no barrier. So if we open that bottle of perfume in the back, there is no barrier preventing that perfume from going from the back to the front. It just doesn't. That is simple diffusion. So an example of that in our body is when hydrophobic substances, so chemicals that do not like water, that are able to get through that plasma membrane, just simply go through. To them, the plasma membrane is not a barrier. It's like it doesn't even exist. It goes right across it. So here, we have our plasma membrane. We have a bunch of whatever this is. We'll say, in this case, we'll call it sugar again. There's a bunch outside, a small amount on the inside. Here, it's going to go across the plasma membrane and work its way in. It's like this is not even here. Facilitated diffusion is dealing with a molecule that cannot get across that plasma membrane. In that case, the plasma membrane is a barrier. It wants to just go, go across. It wants to get from one side to another. 
All we have to do is let it. Give it a hole to let it get through. So in this case, we're going to use what's called an integral membrane protein. Integral means going through. So if I go back a few, a few slides, this is an integral protein. It goes through the plasma membrane. This is an integral protein. It goes through the plasma membrane. The one I really want you to look at is this one. It's got a hole that goes all the way through. Do you see that? That's it called a pore. It's called a what? A pore. P-O-R-E. What that's going to allow is it's going to give a hole for those molecules to move through the plasma membrane. If they go right through this pore, they do not have to deal with the tails of the plasma membrane. It's a shielded little area. And so it's facilitated diffusion. We don't have to pump it through. All we have to do is give it a protected little space <coughs> to go through. So this says that integral protein can be a channel or a carrier. The thing with the pore that just sits there permanently open is a channel. A carrier is something that we're going to see. Imagine you have a protein, integral protein, sitting in the membrane like this. Up is outside the cell. Down is inside the cell. Something wants to get in. Right now, it is closed. In this case, so the outside is open, but the inside oh. part is closed. Okay. So it's not just a pore, right? If something comes in here, it can't get through. A carrier would be something that once the molecule gets in, it goes like that. So it takes one in, dumps it in, opens back up, grabs another one, and just goes back and forth like this. So it's a controlled process. We're allowing the molecule to go the direction it wants to go. We are not pumping it. But the protein continuously opens and closes. Whereas a pore would just be like that. What's the thing that spins that you walk through? Turnstile? The revolving door? Yes. It's like that? Kind of. You can think of it that way. Because if that stops, right, you can't get from outside the building to in unless it turns. If it were to decide, no, I'm done, I'm not <coughs> turning anymore, you're stuck. Okay. Whereas a pore is an open doorway with no door that you can shut. It's just always open. So here's our pore. So this is a, a pore. This is a channel. This is a potassium channel. And so you can see there's a pore, but there's a little gate on the bottom. So in this case, Potassium, if the gate is open, can go right through. But we can also close the gate shut. This is the flip-flop type that I was just talking about. So it's closed. Glucose comes in. It flops. Glucose goes in. And then it has to flip back this to grab another one. And it just goes back and forth and back and forth. So similar to diffusion is something called osmosis. Osmosis is more or less diffusion of water. Okay? But we look at it from a slightly different angle. Diffusion, we just said, was moving from high concentration to low. And osmosis really is that, but just an extra little tweak onto it. So osmosis is the movement of water across a selectively permeable membrane. So again, selectively permeable means some things can get across it, other things can't. In terms of osmosis, we're going to think of it as a membrane that water can get across, but anything that is dissolved in that water, so whether it's sugar or salt, cannot get across. 
So with osmosis, we're going to have two things of solution, or water. Okay? Let's imagine that we have a pipe, and in that pipe we have a membrane. This is that selectively permeable membrane. And then we have two different solutions on the top and the bottom. Up here, we're going to say we have a very high concentration salt solution. Down here, we have a very low concentration salt solution. And so, which direction does the salt want to go? Down. Down. <clears throat> but this is a selectively permeable membrane, and salt cannot get across it. Okay. So salt is not capable of moving here. The only thing that can move is the water that the salt is dissolved in. And so water always moves towards the high solute concentration. So it's towards so, the top. Towards the top. The solute is whatever is dissolved in the water. So in terms of chemistry, we learn that there are solvents and solutes. Solutes get dissolved in solvents. And so in biology, our solvent is always water. We're not dealing with any other solvent than water. Everything gets dissolved in water. And so our solute, in this case, is the salt that's dissolved in it. And so since the salt wants to go down but can't, the water is going to go up. Water will always go towards the high concentration of solute. And so we'll see this in terms of red blood cells. This gets, is really, really important for blood cells. Remember, water moves towards the high concentration of solute. Okay, so this is passive processes. We had diffusion, we had passive diffusion, active diffusion, and osmosis. We were not having to use energy to do any of this. It was just nature doing what nature wants to do. There's no energy, there's no pumps involved. Next, we have to talk about the active transport. Pumping things where they do not want to go. These are going to use energy. The energy is going to come from that ATP. It's going to power a pump. And you can imagine a pump pumping something where it doesn't want to be. If you have a flood and the water is coming into your house, you're pumping it out. If I forget to put the plug in the bottom of my boat and the water comes in, <laughs> my bilge pump is hopefully going to pump it out as fast as it's coming in. It won't. I need to get back to the dock in a big hurry. But the, it's pumping the water out where it does not want to be. Water wants to come into the boat. We have a couple, not more than a couple, a few different ways that we can do this. A few different types of pumps we can use. This is still about active transport, right? This is active transport, yes. The first type is a vesicle. A vesicle is like a bubble. It's a package. We put something in that package, and then we move the package where we want it to go. Why don't you just move the package without putting it in the bubble? Because we'll, we'll see, there's no good way to grab it. And so what we're going to see, imagine I have perfume floating around in here, okay? And I want to get some of that perfume into the room down the hall. I can't, I can't just grab molecules out of the air and take them down there. <coughs> but if I take a container, trap some of this air, move it to that room and then open it up, I've taken the perfume from in here and moved it down there. So the, the vesicles are little packages that we're going to use. We can move it, use it to move things around within a cell and then we'll actually learn we can use it to put something outside of the cell or take it in. But it can't go from like one cell to another cell. 
It can. It can? Yes. And so, we can use vesicles to transport something from one structure in a, in a cell to another structure in the same cell. Okay? We can use it to take in substances. And this is called endocytosis. Endo and exo are two prefixes we're going to see a lot this semester. Endo always means in, exo means out. So endocytosis, endo in, site, cell, osis is a process. So this is taking something into a cell using a vesicle. And we'll see what this looks like in a picture. If what you're taking in is only water, and there's nothing else in that water, there's a special term called pinocytosis, or cell drinking. So if you're just taking in water, it's pinocytosis. If you're taking in something in that water, like nutrients, it's called endocytosis. You can reverse that process and use vesicles to dump something outside of a cell. That's called exocytosis. So imagine you have two cells, one here, one here. If this one undergoes exocytosis to release something outside of a cell, that something can float over to the other one, which uses endocytosis to take it in. The same thing package that got transported from one cell to another. So pinocytosis, can you go both ways? Can you put water out? Pinocytosis is specifically coming in. You can take do, do the opposite, but it actually doesn't have a, spe a special name. It would just be considered endocytosis. Is it considered endocytosis? If you're sending it out, it would just be exocytosis. exocytosis. Okay. So pinocytosis is a special type of endocytosis and there is no special type of exocytosis. So here, we're seeing this happen. So here we have a cell, and here we have endocytosis. So we started with a microbe, okay? This is an immune cell, a white blood cell that's going to eat a bacteria. On the outside of the cell are little claws that are going to grab on to that bacteria. And so these black things are claws as part of the cell. The green thing is the bacteria. When the claws grab it, it's just going to kind of fold around it. Can you see how the this is the plasma membrane that goes all the way around? It's just kind of bulging up and around it. And then eventually it's going to come all the way together. These two things are going to touch together, and it's going to pinch off. And so this little bubble is our vesicle. And it has our little bacterium in it. Don't worry about the term phagosome. Okay, that's not something you need to know. So that, that bacterium is now in a vesicle. It's going to come down merge with something called a lysosome, which we'll learn about in just a little bit. It's basically a vesicle with digestive enzymes in it. Now you combine the, the enzymes with the bacterium, and all havoc breaks loose, and you're left with no bacteria. Bacterium gone. So we use the vesicle to take something in here. You can imagine the same situation going the other direction. If we take something here, imagine this is a vesicle with something in it that we want to dump outside. It's going to move on up to the top to meet the plasma membrane, merge with it, and then dump outside. So here we have a cell with a vesicle with cargo in it. It's going to work its way up to the plasma membrane it's going to merge with the plasma membrane. And all the stuff can escape. So that's exocytosis. The cargo is exiting the cell. So 
now that we are inside the cell, we've gotten things in, whether it be passively or actively, now we can talk about what's inside of the cell. We said that everything inside the cell, except the nucleus, was called cytoplasm. And the water, it's kind of, it's kind of a clear jelly, really, is called the cytosol. This is the intracellular fluid. Intra, inside, cellular fluid. This is the water inside of the cell. Also in that cell is what's called the cytoskeleton. Remember, cyto is cell. So this is the cell skeleton. There are a number of different little fibers in here that are going to provide structure to that cell. <coughs> Not only are they going to provide just a standard skeleton, but we can use those fibers to push. And if we have a cell here, and then we use it some fibers to push and that part of the cell, it's going to kind of bulge out. And then we relax, and eventually when we relax, the cell has moved from here to there. So these fibers are going to allow the cell to move. And there are three types that we'll learn about. There's microfilaments, intermediate filaments, and microtubules. Is that the same thing as a cell wall? No. Okay. A cell wall, if, if we were dealing with a, a plant cell, we would have the plasma membrane here, but then outside of that would be a rigid structure. Which is the wall? Which is the wall. Okay. Also, inside of our cell, we have a bunch of organelles. Organelles are functional parts of a cell. They are going to have membranes around them for the most part. So all these things inside of a cell also have membranes. The nucleus has a membrane. These things are going to have membranes around them. We're going to learn the different parts of a cell. Those parts are called organelles. The first one we're going to learn about are ribosomes. Ribosomes are very popular qu test questions because there's a whole lot of them and they're very very important. Ribosomes make proteins. Proteins are made by ribosomes. There is nothing else that can make a protein. The endoplasmic reticulum, also abbreviated ER, is a, a bunch of folded membranes inside the cell. When we see these in a picture, you'll, see, you'll understand what I mean. But the ER comes in two flavors. There is the rough ER and the smooth ER. The rough ER <coughs> is called rough because there are ribosomes stuck on it. So if we're looking at a cell, and I'm just going to draw a very poor ER here. If there are ribosomes on it and you look at it under the microscope, you're going to see a bunch of dots. And so we call that the rough ER. The part of the ER where there are no dots is called the smooth ER. We said ribosomes make proteins. So the reason that the ribosomes are on the rough ER is because as the ribosomes make the protein, they're essentially injecting the proteins into the ER. And so the rough ER is the site of protein synthesis. Ribosomes actually do the synthesizing, but the rough ER is where it happens. The smooth ER is where we make lipids, the triglycerides, the, the steroids, the phospholipids, things like that that we learned about last week, they are going to get made in the smooth ER. Lipids are made in smooth, proteins are made in the rough ER. 
coming back to our ribosome, this is a little bit bigger, better picture of a cell. I know it might be kind of hard to see in the back though. But this is a nucleus. And around that nucleus, there's a bunch of folds. Kind of a, an olive color here. And then on that, there are a bunch of blue dots. Those are our ribosomes. Each ribosome has two parts. There's a large subunit and a small subunit. Those two pieces come together to make a ribosome. When we get into how proteins are actually made, we'll learn why you need two pieces. Essentially, it's going to act like a clamp. One part comes from the bottom, one part's going to come from the top. Zooming in, we see this a little better. So here's our olive rough ER with the ribosomes on it. As we get away from the nucleus, the ribosomes disappear. So this is the smooth ER. The smooth ER is connected to the rough. There is no clear cut line between them. If you look at it under the microscope, it doesn't actually change color. Just eventually, the ribosomes kind of go away. So does the smoothie arm have lipids on the outside of it, or no? So, these membranes that they're made out of are phospholipids. And so what you're actually seeing is phospholipids. And so, smoothie R and the rough both have phospholipids. Okay. The rough also has ribosomes. Okay. This is a good time to take a break. Okay. We'll come back. seven on that clock. So let's say about seven or eight minutes.
Ribosomes are made, proteins made the rib. The ribosomes <laughs> made the proteins, and where did they dump them into? The rough ER. The rough ER. What did the smooth ER do? Uh, <laughs> they made the lipids. And so we've made proteins, we've made lipids. But we need those lipids and proteins throughout the entire cell. So we need some way to get them from the ER into other places in the cell. And that is the Golgi complex. The Golgi complex, also called the Golgi or the Golgi body, is essentially the shipping center of the cell. It's going to take those proteins and those lipids that are made in the ER, package them into vesicles, and ship them to different parts of the cell. So it's going to take these proteins, in some cases it's going to modify them, because not every protein that gets made is going to have the same exact purpose. Some of them need to get fine-tuned to do this, some of them need to get fine-tuned to do that. <coughs> and so any little final tweaks on the protein are going to be done in the Golgi, they're going to be packaged them, they're going to be put in the vesicles, and they're going to be shipped off. So here in our cell, we have the ER, and here we have the Golgi. So here's our rough ER, there's our smooth ER, here's our Golgi. They look very similar to each other. They are all different folds of the plasma membrane. So what you want to look for is right next to the nucleus is going to be the rough ER. And that you can pick out really easy because it has the ribosomes on it. The smooth ER is attached to the rough ER. This just kind of transitions into that. The Golgi is right next to them, but not attached. So if you're looking at a model or a diagram, you're looking for the one that is not attached. That is your Golgi. Zooming in, we can see here's a, a vesicle that's leaving the Golgi here. Here's a vesicle that's bringing things from the ER to the Golgi. So it's just it's kind of a, just a non-specific <coughs> big truck that just brings everything and just dumps it there. It doesn't know where it's going. It just brings it from the factory and dumps it in. The Golgi then figures out where they're going. Sends some of them over here, some of them over there, some over there. Then this is going to pinch off, become a vesicle and go over there. This one's going to pinch off and go over there. But it's still in the cell. It's still in the cell. All the vesicles are still in the cell. In, 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 at this point, yes. It's possible that we can make enough proteins that need to get outside of a cell. There are proteins that go outside of cells. In vesicles? In vesicles. And so we could take a bunch of those proteins, put them into one special vesicle, and send that one all the way to the edge of the cell. It's still a vesicle. It's just, it's going, instead of being used to transport in the cell, it's going to be used for exocytosis. Okay. It's just how far do you go? Do you go all the way to the edge, or do you just stop halfway there? Next we have things that are designed to break things down. They digest things. And they all digest slightly different things. First are the lysosomes that we saw earlier. That's what fused with that with the uh, vesicle. They have the bacterium in it. This is used to contain digestive enzymes. The lysosomes 
are used in recycling and waste disposal. And so when we brought that bacterium in, at that point it was just waste. We didn't need it, and so we're going to use a lysosome to break it down. Once we break it down though, we now have the building blocks. We have amino acids, we have nucleic, we have nucleotides. We can reuse those pieces. And so it's going to recycle them. Also parts of a cell, ribosomes get old. The parts of the rough ER, the smooth ER, the Golgi, they get old. They get worn out. We can use a lysosome, break them down, get the basic pieces back, and use those pieces to rebuild the backup. We're going to recycle everything. But that's still considered a vesicle. Yes, a lysosome is a vesicle, a specific type of vesicle that contains digestive enzymes. Okay. And they just sit around. They sit around waiting to be needed. Okay. Very, very similar to a lysosome is a peroxisome. A peroxisome is also a vesicle that just sits around. It is used for breaking things down, but it's going to be used for metabolism. It's primarily going to be used to break down lipids. Lipids that we eat, things that we want to break down and get energy out of. The peroxisome is going to do that. And so a lysosome is going to take big things and break it down into basic building blocks. A peroxisome is just going to completely grind everything up into basically something that we can eat. So imagine taking a house that's made of bricks. You can take it apart and take get the individual bricks. A lysosome would be doing that. A peroxisome would take the whole thing, just grind it up. We don't want to use it again. We just want to get rid of it. We want to use it something we can eat. Get, get as much energy out of it as possible. Is that a vesicle? Yes, peroxisomes are vesicles. Lysosomes are also, proteasomes are not. A proteasome is not a vesicle. It's kind of just a big bundle of proteins. The proteasome digests proteins. At any given time, we have millions and millions of proteins in our cells doing things. Proteins have a short shelf life, though. They constantly have to be replaced. And so if every time a protein got worn out, we got rid of those amino acids, we'd be wasting a whole bunch of amino acids. And so a proteasome is going to recycle and break down a protein. A lysosome is going to recycle big things, like an organelle, like an, a ribosome, or, or an ER, something like that. A proteasome is going to recycle a single protein, one molecule. It's a big molecule, but it is just a single molecule. It's not a big structure. Next are the mitochondria. The mitochondria are where we make our ATP. So people like to think of the mitochondria as the power plants of our cell. If we don't have enough mitochondria, we can't make enough ATP, and so we have no energy to do anything. And the number of mitochondria in a cell is dependent on how much energy that cell needs. Some cells may have 100 mitochondria. Some may have 1,000. Some may have 10,000 of them. What do you think is a type of cell that may need lots of energy? The energy is in the form of ATP. What's a type of cell that you think may need a lot of energy in the form of ATP? What's a type of cell that does something? Like tissue? What, which, which type of tissue? Like cell tissue. Which type of cell tissue? Yeah. <laughs> red blood cells. No, not, red blood cells don't actually do much. Skin tissue. Skin? Is my skin doing anything? No. no. Your heart. My heart. Muscle. There's mu my heart is muscle, right? We'll learn there are multiple types of muscle, but my heart is muscle. All the cells that make in my arms go like this. They're doing something, right? 
And it takes a lot, imagine a tiny little microscopic cell that is moving my arm. It, that takes a lot of energy to do that. So muscle cells are going to have a lot of mitochondria. Something like a red blood cell or a skin cell, where they just kind of do their job by existing, they don't need that much energy. They need enough energy to stay alive, but they don't need enough energy to actually do anything. So the mitochondria have a bunch of folds inside. We'll see it here. There's a bunch of folds inside called Christi. And then inside of that is called the matrix. <coughs> so here is a mitochondria. Mitochondria is plural. Mitochondrion, I-O-N, I-O-N is singular. So this is one mitochondrion. This actually has two membranes on it. There's an outer membrane and an inner membrane. And the inner membrane has a bunch of folds. These are the Christi. And then the empty space on the very, very inside is the matrix. And then on those folds, there are enzymes, proteins, that actually make the ATP. That's on what? Where is um, it? So this is zoomed in to this fold here. You see this kind of fold? Same shape here. Okay. So stuck onto these folds are little enzymes that actually make the ATP. Now interesting, how many people have taken just general biology? Do you remember the theory that explains why mitochondria have two membranes? No. <laughs> so the idea is that the inner membrane started as a bacterium. Imagine when we had that bacterium that got swallowed by a vesicle. That bacterium essentially had two membranes, its own and then the vesicle. And over millions and millions and millions of years, that bacterium in the cell decided, hey, rather than digesting you, I'll let you live here, but you give me a bunch of ATP. <laughs> and so it's thought that the mitochondria actually started out as a bacterium that lived outside of cells that kind of learned to grow inside of the cell. So what are the little orange dots? These orange dots? Yes. They're enzymes, they're proteins. Just any enzyme, just any enzyme? Well, they're specific enzymes, but we don't learn okay. which they are. They're and specific enzymes whose job it is to make ATP. Okay. So the matrix is just a lot of those? The matrix is the empty space in here. So it has no purpose? Not really, no. If, if you took this in, if you took 2085 or a more, a more advanced dynamic physiology, what you would learn is that there's actually diffusion going on here. It's like a water wheel. Water coming from a high, going through the water wheel, spins the water wheel, and you get energy. Same thing goes on here. Something goes through the membrane, and when it does, it spins the water wheel, and that enzyme is the water wheel. So as it goes through, it spins and it gives off energy. That's more complicated than we need to worry about here. Finally, I think finally, yeah, finally, we get to the nucleus. By far the largest organelle inside the cell. You're going to learn, when you look at cells in the microscope, your eyes are going to go to nuclei. That is what you're going to see, okay? The more you use that, the more you use a microscope, the more cells you look at, the more you focus on the nuclei. So the nucleus, sorry, most cells have one nucleus. 99.9% .9 of the cells in your body have one nucleus. Red blood cells have none. We'll talk more about this in the lab today, but red blood cells just do their job by existing. They don't make copies of themselves, they exist, and then they fall apart and they turn into dust. They're just gone. And so they don't need a nucleus. The nucleus is the instructions for the next generation of cells. But 
Red blood cells have no next generation. They are the end of the line. And so they get rid of the nucleus so they can carry more hemoglobin. They have more space to carry the oxygen that they are designed to carry. Skeletal muscle cells have multiple nuclei. Again, we'll see that in lab today. Skeletal muscle cells are massive. They are some of the largest cells in the body. And so they have multiple nuclei because the nuclei are the instructions on how to run. And so if you have a gigantic cell and the instructions are on one end and you need them on the other end, you can't get the instructions over there. And so you have multiple copies of the instructions spread out throughout the cell. Because most cells are small enough, you only need one copy. So that's why they only have one. The nucleus also has a double membrane. Again, it's thought that this started as a bacterium that got swallowed up. This double membrane is called the nuclear envelope or the nuclear membrane. Same thing. Different textbooks use different terms. So that's going to separate, separate the inside of the nucleus from the cytoplasm outside. And then in that nuclear envelope, there are holes. The holes are called nuclear pores. They're going to allow things in and out. And we'll see some of those things that need to get in and out. The inside of the nucleus are smaller spheres called nucleoli. The sing singular would be nucleolus, L-U-S. This is where ribosomes are made. In the nucleoli or nucleoli, different people pronounce it different ways. That's where ribosomes are made? This is where ribosomes are made, yes. The rest of the nucleus is used to store DNA. So the nucleus has two functions. The biggest is to store DNA. That is the prominent, most famous feature of the nucleus. It is where the DNA is stored. But within the nucleus are little areas called nucleoli, and in those spaces are where the ribosomes are made. Once they're made there, they'll go outside, they'll go out the pores to grab onto the rough ER. Our genes, the instructions for us, are on what is called chromosomes. The chromosomes are the nucleic acid molecules in our body. They are millions of atoms long. They are absolutely monstrous. Most cells in our body have 46 chromosomes. The only exceptions are cells that have no nuclei, multiple nuclei. So any cell that has one nucleus is going to have 46 chromosomes, and of those 46, 23 came from each parent. So there are 23 pairs of chromosomes. They're essentially duplicates of each other, but obviously your mother and your father are a little bit different, so they're not exact duplicates. They serve the same purpose, they're just a little bit different from each other. So 23 pairs gives us 46 total. Now we'll learn that the reproductive cells in our bodies, the eggs and the sperm, do not have 46. They each have 23. So that when they come together, the cell that they make has 46. <coughs> so here's our nucleus. You see the rough ER out here. Here's our nucleus. There's holes in here that are going to be our nuclear pores. In the very center, it's not, all, not always in the very center, they could be spread out, and there could be two or three or four of them, is the nucleus. So here, the ribosomes are being made, and out here, the DNA is stored. So one cell could have like different Yes. It kind of depends on how many ribosomes that cell needs. 
if you have a cell that needs a lot of protein, you need a lot of ribosomes to make that lot of protein. If you need a lot of ribosomes, you need more nucleoli. On our microscopes here, we're not going to be able to zoom in far enough to even see these. You're going to see nuclei as little purple dots, and nothing more than that. So now we get to learn about how these genes work. How we take instructions and turn it into protein. Remember, anything in our cell that does something is a protein. The structure is a protein. The enzymes are a protein. DNA does nothing. It is nothing but instructions to make the proteins. We are constantly making proteins. Like I said, they have a short shelf life. <coughs> we have to constantly make them. We cannot stop. If we do, that cell will die. So we'll call it to make DNA. Say it again? We'll call it to make DNA. Sort of. In a, in a different process, though. We have the DNA is a permanent copy. Oh, okay. We can use that copy to make as many proteins as we need. For the life of that cell, we have the one copy. So to make protein, we have this process. It's called the dogma of biology. Everything revolves around this. DNA is used to make mRNA. We'll learn about that. That's a specific type of RNA. And then mRNA is used to make protein. So I think last week I used the example of DNA as being the master copy. And it does not leave the safe room. It doesn't leave the office. If you're building a house, the original copy of the blueprints stays in the office. If you want to take that to the job site, you better make a copy of it. The mRNA <coughs> is a copy of the DNA. DNA does not leave the nucleus. But the ribosome, the rough ER where the proteins are made, are outside the nucleus. And so we're going to take DNA to make mRNA, take that outside to the ribosomes, and then use the mRNA as instructions for the protein. The process of taking DNA and copying it into mRNA is called transcription. And because the DNA does not leave the nucleus, that means transcription has to happen in the nucleus. If you're going to make a copy of the master copy, you have to go to where the master copy is stored. And that's in the nucleus. Once that mRNA is made, it can come outside through the nuclear pores. It's small, it's narrow, it can wiggle its way out. We're then going to use that mRNA in a process called translation. Translation is going to turn mRNA into protein, and that's going to happen in the cytoplasm. Remember, DNA and RNA are both nucleic acids. They're very, very similar to each other. But protein is amino acids. And so that's why we call this one translation. We're taking something in one language and turning it into a very, very different language. Okay? DNA to mRNA, it's basically the same language. It's like my English versus Stark <laughs> English. Okay? You say milk, I say milk. Okay? <laughs> it's the same language, different dialect. A okay. little bit different. But if we go to French or Spanish, everything's off the table. Right? It's completely different language. DNA, transcription, is the copying of DNA into mRNA, and we use do that by an enzyme called RNA polymerase. So ACE tells us it's an enzyme. Polymer means we're making a polymer, which is a big, long string of molecules. And so we're make, this is an enzyme that makes a polymer, and the polymer we're making is RNA. So we're going to take nucleotide plus nucleotide plus nucleotide plus nucleotide, a whole bunch of them, thousands and thousands of them, to make RNA. 
Is it true that the blueprint in just one cell is, is the entire body is the same? Yes. That's At every cell in our body has the entire set of instructions. That's fascinating. We, the part like my skin shuts off the part that's instruction of my heart. But it's there. But it's still there. It's still there. It's a hologram, basically. The whole body. I'm not sure I'm yet imagining how the hologram works. But. Well, hologram is just a little pieces of the whole. So, it's fascinating. So the RNA comes in three types. The type that is that temporary copy is the mRNA. It's messenger RNA. You do it with a lowercase m RNA. That ribosome that makes the protein is actually mostly RNA. And so we call that ribosomal RNA, rRNA. And then there is transfer RNA that we'll see in, in the process of translation. So that is tRNA. So mRNA are the temporary instructions. The rRNA and tRNA help to use those instructions to make the protein. This is transcription, and there's a lot going on there. But it's actually not as complicated as it looks, because in reality, that whole thing is one molecule. It's one thing. All that is, is an mRNA molecule. And then this, the purple here, is DNA. That's a double helix that's unzipped. There's just one little twist in the DNA that's been unzipped. We take the DNA, where it has the instructions we want to copy, we unzip it, the RNA polymerase, this yellow blob, yes, scientists imagine proteins as blobs. You can go to the most high profile <laughs> scientific journal out there and they're talking about proteins and they're drawing them, they're going to be blobs. We think of them as blobs. And so this yellow blob is our RNA polymerase enzyme. The thing that's going to copy the DNA into RNA. So it latches on to the unzipped spot, and it just moves its way down the DNA, unzipping as it goes. And as it goes, it's making the mRNA. And so we just kind of kind of trail off the back. When we finish, I'll, I'll get a YouTube video, and you can really see this happen. So now, we've taken our DNA, the purple here, and we've made the mRNA, our temporary instructions. So now we can use those temporary instructions to make our protein. That is the translation. And this is a more complicated process. Transcription is just one enzyme going along the DNA, making a molecule as it goes. Translation has three things working together. Number one, we have the mRNA. We have to have the instructions. You can't make a protein if you don't have the instructions. On that mRNA is a little site called a recognition or a protein cap or recognition site. Ribosomes like to find it. The ribosomes find it and they grab up. So now we have the ribosome, which makes the protein, stuck on to our mRNA. That's what the transfer was? Right now we're just the mRNA. So what we have, see that's our, our, our mRNA. It's a big long strip, okay? And right here, we have a recognition site. Ribosome <coughs> seek out those recognition sites. And so once we find the recognition site, these two parts of the ribosome are going to make a sandwich with the RNA between them. So this and this are the two parts of the ribosome. We said there are two subunits. So now we now have a sandwich with two parts of a ribosome with the mRNA between it. Then, transfer RNA comes in. 
Because in translation, we're taking RNA and we need to make protein. And the building blocks of a protein are amino acids. So something needs to bring the amino acid to the ribosome. And it has to know which one. Because this ribosome is going to work its way down. And encoded on this mRNA are the sequence of amino acids we need to do. Remember, there are 20 different amino acids. And so as we go down, there may be instructions for G, T, A, S. And so as the ribosome goes, it needs to be handed the correct amino acid. And so we're going to start going. Our, amino acid, our ribosome has started going. It's now on the instructions for a G. I thought the star was the ribosome. No, the star is the recognition site that the ribosome grabs on. So the ribosome grabbed onto the star, and now it's moved one step over. It's on the instructions for a G. There are tRNAs, transfer RNAs, floating around, and there are 20 of them. Each type has a specific amino acid. And so when a ribosome gets to a G, it says, give me a G. And whatever tRNA that's floating around down here, that is attached to a G is going to bring that G here. It's going to lay down a G. And the ribosome is going to move to a T. And then the tRNA with a T amino acid is going to come in. And so we're going to make a G and a T and we're going to put a peptide bond between them. And then we're going to bring in an A and then an S. We're going to keep putting peptide bonds together. And as we, after we finish, we now have the protein. So the mRNA is the instructions. The ribosome is the worker that reads the instructions. The tRNA is the worker that brings the actual building block and sets it down. And then, there's, of course, there's the ribosome, which is the third part. So the instructions, the ribosome, which reads the instructions, and then the tRNA, which brings in the raw ingredients. Does this make sense? Can you imagine this happening? Okay. Do you know where GTAS came from? I made that up. Okay. And so, I'm good. Okay. We're sitting here trying to figure it out. So this is just <laughs> en encoded on this string are instructions. And so I'm saying, the instructions tell me I need a G, a T, an A, and an S. Those are amino acids. Okay. So when the ribosome gets to the instruction that says, you need a G, the ribosome says, give me a G, and the G tRNA brings it a G. So that is the actual G. So the G that's up there in the first place is a nucleotide. This G is a nucleotide. Okay, and then it talks and it says, hey, I need uh, a G acid. amino acid. And then that makes what? A T? So we, we, we get a G, and then once we get the next one, we make a peptide bond. That's just what it is. It just needs a peptide bond after that? The peptide bonds contain connect one amino acid to another, to another, to another. So here, this is the, just the instructions. So the instructions don't actually say GTAS. They say something that when me, the ribosome, reads the instructions, I know that means I need a G. And so I say, Lane, bring me a G. So Lane brings me a G. So I take his G and I set it down. And then I say, I move on. I read the next set of instructions. And I say, OK, I know that means I need a T. But it's a transfer. In this case, the T is an, ami is an amino acid. Let me, let me get rid of T. I can see how that's <laughs> Number them. Let's change T to an R. These are just arbitrary things. 
Let's say the instructions are not a T. The instructions are for an R. So I, I still have lane G sitting here. I move on to the next set of the instructions, and I read it, and I say, that means I need an R. So I say, Savannah, bring me an R. She brings me an R. You're in nucleotide right now because you don't have the amino acid, right? I am the ribosome. The ribosome. I'm the one reading the instructions. I have a sheet of paper that are the instructions. Okay. The sheet of paper, the instructions are the mRNA. I, I, as the ribosome, have grabbed onto those instructions. I read the first line. It says, you need a G. So I say, Lay, Lane, bring me a G. He brings me a G. I set it on the table. Okay. I go down to the second line of my MR, and I read it, and I know this means I need an R. So I say, Savannah, bring me an R. She brings me an R. I attach it to lane G, and they're both sitting on the table now. So what are they together? Together, we're making amino acids. Oh, so you're nothing yet. You're a part of a protein. This sitting here is part of a protein. Gotcha. I'm a ribosome. The paper in my hand is the mRNA. Lane and Savannah, who brought me amino acids, are tRNAs. Okay. Got it. Does everybody got it? I don't know. Hopefully, like I said, uh, I'll find a YouTube video, and I think that will hopefully make it a little easier, rather than me standing up here going like this, okay? So this is what's going on, but that's a very complicated thing. I'm not going to talk about this picture. If this helps you understand that, be my guest to come back to it and look at it. So we'll come back to that. Next, we have to talk about cell division. So cells in my body are constantly dying. I need to replace them. So we replace dying cells using cell division. One cell divides into two. Somatic cell division, tell me this is happening somewhere in my body other than the reproductive organs. So anywhere in my body other than something that is making sperm. In a female, it'll be anywhere other than some place that is making eggs. So all we're doing in somatic cell division is making a copy of itself. One cell makes two clones. This is how we are going to make cells. We all started out as one cell, the combination of a sperm and an egg. We are now millions and millions and millions of cells. It kept dividing and making more and more and more cells. Reproductive cell division is different. Reproductive cell division is called meiosis. This is the process of making sperm and eggs, and egg is an oocyte. So in this case, the cell is basically going to split in half. In reproductive cell division, or meiosis, a cell is going to split in half. The cell is going to start with 46 chromosomes, and it's going to get cut in half to make two cells with 23. Okay. Because a sperm and an egg can only have 23. So that when they come together, we have the full set of 46. Somatic cell division is called mitosis. This is a cell dividing into two identical cells that are also identical to the parent cell, the cell you started with. So the cell you started with had 46 chromosomes. The two new <coughs> cells, called the daughter cells, also have 46. So you made the kid and then you're developing the kid. These are two very different, yes, yes, okay. yes. So we are, let's say, at fertilization, we have a sperm with 23 chromosomes and an egg with 23 chromosomes. They come together to make a single cell with 46. 
that is the beginning of us. That one cell then splits to make two cells. It's 46. That's the somatic part, right? Yes. Then those split to make cells with 46. How do they spell 46? Yeah, when 46 split. We're actually going to have to double our DNA just before we split. Oh, okay. And so we're going to go from 46 <coughs> to 92 but, but for a very short period of time. Okay. <coughs> this is a very good question, though, to see that you can't just take 46 and mm, otherwise... I mean, but the top part is the reproductive part. Yes. Okay, that's just cool. I got this part. Reproductive. I mean, above the 23, There was a 46 that made two 23s. Yes. That one did not copy its DNA before it split. So it made two sperm. Okay. One of those then combined with an egg. What did the other one do? The other one failed. It died? Died, whatever. <laughs> and so meiosis, this here, is meiosis. Taking 46 and making two 23s is meiosis. Okay. Once we made, <coughs> did meiosis, we got sperm and an egg, they came together, we got that. This is mitosis. 46 making two 46. So what is two 23 and one 46? Fertilization. But okay. That's not, that's in the reproductive lecture at the very, very end. So a 46 making two 23s is meiosis, a 46 making two 46s is mitosis. The way I remember which one is meiosis, which one is mitosis, is I think my toe. If I stub my toe and hurt my toe, I'm going to have to do somatic cell division to fix it, to heal it. And so that is literally how I remember that mitosis is just making copies of cells. And so meiosis is by default the other one. So reproductive. You need a new cell. Yes. Some of the cells that are next to the wound are going to divide to make new cells to fill in the wound. So it's the same cell. Yes. Okay. And right at conception, the very first cell has the DNA and the copy of everything, right? Yes. That cell Yeah, of course. Has the copy, the copy of everything that one that one cell That's you started as yeah. had the instructions for everything, and those same instructions are now in every cell in your body. Yeah, and is it true every seven years that your cells die and you replenish? So basically, so you know, certain physical? some cells die off much faster than others. Okay. So things like the lining of your esophagus, the lining of your intestine, your hair follicle, they have very short. Lives. Mm -hmm. Other things like brain neurons are basically there your entire life. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's and kind so, of a myth. So you can't just say in every so many years you're a completely new person. Because some, some things you're completely new every month. Every month, yeah. Other things you basically never, you always have some of the originals. But for the most part, in most of your masses, it does change. I, I don't know the, the date to say at this point. Oh, yeah, yeah. Most of you, it's, but you get the idea. Yeah. So a cell life is called the cell cycle. The cell is going to have different phases in its life. Most of its life, it's going to be existing, doing what it was made to do. A short period of its life, it's going to be reproducing. It's going to be splitting. And then a short period of its life, it's going to be preparing to split. This is called the cell cycle because it goes through that same pattern over and over and over again. And so we're going to go through the same pattern. That cell cycle has two main parts. There's mitosis, or mitotic phase, which is when the cell's actually dividing. And then there's interphase, which is any time the cell is not dividing. So most of a cell's life is spent in interface. And then a small part of it is spent in mitosis. 
DNA replication. It's copying of the DNA so that it can split without losing DNA. Happens in interphase. And mitosis is the division of that cell into two new cells. So mitosis has four main stages. Prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. Remember it as PMAT. PMAT. P-M-A-T. That's going to tell you the order. Then you just need to remember what the phase names are. So mitosis is the division of the DNA in the cell into two new cells. There are four parts to that. Prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. So we're going to see what happens in each of those here. So up here is interface. The cell is not dividing. It's sitting there doing, doing what it was designed to do. We're now going to enter mitosis. And the first phase of mitosis is prophase. Pro, one, or beginning. The prophase, at prophase, the <coughs> chromosomes are going to do what we call condense. In interphase, if you look at them under the microscope, you cannot see individual chromosomes. It's just a big bowl of mixed up spaghetti. At prophase, the chromosomes kind of separate themselves. This chromosome goes over here, this one goes over here, so they kind of untangle themselves. And so here we can't see individual chromosomes, here we can. That's these X's. Each X here, is a chromosome. And we have red ones and blue ones. Red from female, mother, blue from father. So, so they untangle. Right? So they untangle and they become visible. The nucleus is also breaking down. The membrane around the nucleus breaks down. We need to allow those the DNA to escape. So we need half of them to go here, half of them to go there. And if they're all trapped in a nucleus, we can't do that. So the chromosomes condense and the, and the nucleus breaks down. We also start to see these spindles forming. The spindles are little fingers. They're going to reach out, grab the chromosomes, and then pull them in two different directions. So the chromosomes become visible and they start to attach to the spindles. In metaphase, meta means middle. This is very similar to prophase, except the chromosomes are now lined up right down the middle. We call that the metaphase plate. They're lined up right down the middle, and they're all attached to the spindles. After that is anaphase. In anaphase, the spindles start to pull apart. And so we've taken these X's and broken them in half. Half of the X is going that way, half of the X is going that way. So the chromosomes are still near the center, but they're not on the center, and they're broken apart. So metaphase just lines them up, and then yes. anaphase is yanked them apart. Anaphase is beginning of the yanking apart. Telophase is when we've gotten the chromosomes all the way to the opposite sides. They're completely yanked apart now. And the nuclei are starting to reform. So you've got the DNA into two sides of the cell. We're now going to collapse the nucleus, trap the DNA on the two sides of the cell. And you can see that the cell itself is starting to pinch. So eventually, this is going to pinch all the way through and split. This is not up here, but that splitting process is called cytokinesis. We'll see that in, in the lab. That's cyto for cell, kinesis for movement. So cytokinesis is the actual splitting of the cell.
We'll finish it and then we'll, we'll take our break. So meiosis is very, very similar. We'll talk more detail about meiosis in the reproductive lecture. But meiosis is very similar. It just it pulls the chromosomes apart without copying them first. Basically the same process. You just pull the chromosomes apart. We start with 46, pull 23 over here, 23 over here. Cellular metabolism is the cells taking nutrients and converting them into energy in the form of ATP. So we're gonna take protein, carbohydrates, and lipids, break them down into ATP. We need to get that energy from somewhere. And we're going to get them from breaking down proteins, carbohydrates, and lipids. There are two different ways that we can do that. There's anaerobic metabolism and aerobic metabolism. Anaerobic means without air. Aerobic is with air. In particular, we're talking about oxygen. So anaerobic happens where there is no air or oxygen available. This is going to happen in the cytosol. And when we take something like a glucose, we get lactic acid, which we don't want, and two ATPs. If we have oxygen, we can do <coughs> metabolism in the mitochondria, where it's supposed to happen. If we do it there, we get 36 ATP and no waste product. So obviously, we want to do aerobic. But if we don't have enough oxygen, if we're exercising, and we can't keep up getting the oxygen in as we're using it, we have to switch to anaerobic. So it's better than nothing, but it's not what we actually want to do. Okay. Let's take a break. We'll come back at five after on that clock. So it's 11 minutes. We then have tissues. This lecture is not brought to you by Kleenex brand. They don't know that I am doing it. So we have four major types of tissues in our body. Every tissue in our body falls into one of these four. The third and the fourth are kind of smaller, more more distinct categories. The muscular tissue, nervous tissue are very, they have a very, very strict definition. They're each gonna have their own separate lecture because we have a muscular system and we have a nervous system. So they, they'll get their whole, a whole lecture to themselves. We won't spend much time on them today at all. I think they each get one slide. Most of today is spent on epithelial tissue and connective tissue, which has a, they both have a whole bunch of different types of tissue that fall under that category. So epithelial tissue covers things for the most part. They're going to cover the body surface. If you have a tissue that interacts and touches the outside world, that is most likely going to be an epithelial tissue. It lines the body cavities. So lining the thoracic cavity, and the abdominal pelvic cavity, and the vertebral cavity are these epithelial tissues. If we have an organ that is hollow, can you think of an organ that would be hollow? I would not necessarily include esophagus as an organ. Heart, yes, the heart is hollow. Why is it hollow? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. But so if uh, if you drain if you drain a heart, there is nothing in it. But what did you drain out of it? Blood. So evolutionarily. Why did the, did the heart evolve to be hollow? 
so that it can fill with blood. If your heart is solid, you can't get any blood into it. What's another organ that would be hollow? Lungs. Lungs. Yes. You have to get <coughs> air into your lungs. What's another one? You got two big ears. Your stomach. Stomach. Bladder. Bladder. Yes. They're all things that contain something else. So lining those organs are going to be the epithelial tissue. We're going to learn about different ducts that are in our body where a fluid is going to move through them. Those ducts are going to be lined by epithelial tissue. And then we're going to learn about quite a few different glands in our body. Glands are going to make hormones or make something else that they're going to secrete or excrete. We'll learn the difference between that. So if you have a gland that is making something, that is going to be epithelial tissue. Connective tissue is primarily for protection and support. It's going to be the glue that holds everything together. It's going to be the padding that protects all of the major organs. It's going to be everything that does not serve a, a it's kind of a helper function. It doesn't do anything on its own, but it helps to keep everything else working correctly. So it supports it, our bones, our connective tissue, supporting our body. It binds organs together. The organs in our, in our body are held in place by the connective tissue. Connective <coughs> tissue is going to store energy. Fat, we'll learn today, is a type of connective tissue. And it's also going to provide immunity. In this one kind of seems probably a little different than the rest, a little more specialized. And that's because we consider blood as being a connective tissue. Blood? Blood, we'll learn, is a connective tissue. It doesn't immediately pop up in your mind as something that would be classified as a connective tissue because it's not connecting things together. Something like the glue in our, in our body would be doing, holding different organs together. Fat is fat? Yes. Muscle, muscle tissue is going to be made up of muscle cells. It's going to provide force. It's going to contract and provide force. When it contracts and provides that force, it can do a number of different things. We can help move our body, or we can change the shape of the organs in our body. A lot of times for the purpose of contracting and squeezing something. Nervous tissue is going to detect things affecting our body from the outside. So temperature and touch and light and things like that. It's going to take that, that signal, transmit nerve impulses, which are electrical signals, and that's going to go to someplace, either your brain or your spinal cord. That is then going to make a decision, send another electrical impulse back to, to some place in the body, whether it be a muscle or a gland or whatever it may need to be, to help maintain our homeostasis. So epithelial tissue is the first one we're going to talk about. Epithelial tissues have two surfaces. We're going to see these. An epithelial tissue is usually a layer of cells. It is not a glob of cells. It is a layer of cells. And if you have a layer, you are automatically going to have two surfaces. So this is a layer of cells. There's a whole bunch of cells in here. Obviously, you have this surface and you have that surface. The apical surface is the surface that is exposed to the outside or an empty space. So if we're talking the skin, the apical surface is the side of the skin that touches the air. If we're talking <coughs> the lungs, it's going to be the surface that touches the cavity of the lung. Like this is my cup, my lungs 
So if we have lungs, well, these are going to be really bad. <laughs> it is this surface. It is the one that is interacting with the outside world. In, in the lungs, the outside world is inside of the lungs. Because the air that I breathe in is going into here. What about the heart? What about the heart? What, what about it? It's the same way with the heart. Yes. It's going to be <coughs> where the blood is. But, so it's lining the, it's either interact, touching the outside or lining the cavity. So the cavity is considered everything but the organ. It's the empty space inside of the organ. Okay. That's the bad part. Like the world. Like the world to the skin is the inside of the body. <coughs> I'm not sure I follow. Okay, so like our heart, this is what, what did you say? I don't know. <laughs> what is the world to the skin? <coughs> An oyster? This <laughs> <laughs> is, is the lining of what? <laughs> so, the epithelial, the apical surface, is the one that is going to touch the outside world. The outside world is what I'm thinking. Okay, so okay. apical so, surface. So that the skin or the lungs, the apical surface is touching the outside world. If you're and talking about organs, it's going to touch the inside of the organs. Yes. Yeah. For the most, yes. So you can imagine your lung is hollow, right? Yes. So lining the inside of that lung, on the inside of that lung, here, <coughs> is the apical surface. That's considered it's the bad. surface that's not attached to something else. How about that? <coughs> and so the skin, you have the skin, right? Uh -huh. On the, Underneath the skin, oh, it's oh. a... Okay, I'll <laughs> <laughs> It's attached to something else. Yeah. But this surface clearly is not attached to something else. Right? This surface of my skin is not attached yeah, to something. The outside surface is not. If, unless I, if I have a super glue accident, that may be different. But right now, it, this surface of my skin is not attached to anything. That's called the apical? It's the apical surface. Okay. In my lungs, the inside, the hollow part of my lung, that surface is not attached to anything. Oh. But the outside of the lung, this part here, is attached to stuff. It's holding that lung in place. That's the basal. That is the basal surface. Yes. You can generally think of it as upper and lower. But that's not always the case, because if I look at the palm of my hand, the apical is the bottom, right? And here, it's going sideways, so there's a left and a right side, not an up, up and down. But if you think of a, a, a layer of skin going left and right, so you have a top and a bottom, and the top is openness. Okay. That is your apical surface. The bottom is the basal. B for bottom, B for basement. So if we have a layer of cells, <coughs> that layer can be one cell thick or it can be multiple cells thick. When we classify our epithelial tissue, we're going to classify them and give them a two word name. The first word is going to be based off how many layers they have. It's either going to be one or more than one. And the second word is going to be based on cell shape. So if based on the number of layers, we can say something is a simple epithelium, meaning that it has a single layer of cells. A simple epithelium has one layer of cells. <coughs> and it only has one layer of cells because whatever that epithelium is designed to do, it's probably allowing something to cross it. If we are going to allow something to diffuse across it, you can't have a big, 
thick thing or whatever it needs to fuse to get in. We'll see that the lining of our, of our lungs is a simple epithelium. We need to very easily get oxygen in and very easily get carbon dioxide out. If we have 20 layers of cells, it's hard for that to happen. Here we have osmosis, so water needs to get in or out. So we're going to see simple epithelium in something like the kidney, where the water needs to very easily get through. Same thing with filtration in the kidney. You can force water through, and the bigger molecules get left behind. Secretion, so you're secreting something like sweat, or absorption, where you're absorbing nutrients, like in your intestine. So a simple epithelium is designed to allow something to pass across it. I'm going to skip this one and come down stratified and come back up pseudo stratified. A stratified epithelium is two or more layers thick. So if you look under the microscope, you see a picture. If there's one single layer of cells, it is simple. If there is more than that, it is stratified. These are more for protection. We'll see that our skin is a whole bunch of layers of cells. There's a bunch of layers. And so, in that case, it makes it stronger. And also, if you, something happens to it, you bump it, you scratch it, and you take off the first few layers, you still have layers underneath. Whereas if you only had one layer, and you damaged it, you now have a hole. So, so if you say it again. So we have this everywhere. Where? where is it? <coughs> so that only inside the body. Simple epithelium. Simple, simple epithelium. <laughs> yes, will only be in the body. <coughs> but stratified. So we'll learn. We'll learn more specific because there are other type. There are multiple types of simple and multiple types of stratified. So we'll learn where each of those subtypes are located. That and that's coming up. Pseudostratified is confusing. Pseudostratified, when you first look at it, it looks like it's multiple layers. But when you take a very close look, you can actually see that every single cell in there touches the top and the bottom. We'll see what this looks like. But it's called pseudostratified because it looks stratified, but in actuality, it's actually a single layer. So this is a simple epithelium. There's one layer of cells. This is stratified. There's multiple layers. All of these epithelial tissues are going to be sitting on top of what we call the basement membrane. That's what glues the epithelial tissue to whatever is underneath it, or whatever it is attached to. So the basal side touches the basement membrane. And the basement membrane is usually to the bottom. That's the outside of the The outside is in this surface. Okay. Yes. Pseudostratified, so if you look at it, I mean, you have nuclei down here and nuclei up here. At first glance, it looks like it's multiple layers. But if we pick each one, so this one's attached to here. If you could follow it, it that kind of disappears behind this one, and that's it touching the apical surface <coughs> there. This one touches the apical surface there, and the base, basal surface there. They all touch the top and the bottom. This one is hard to see under the microscope, because just like here, everything gets cut. And so it's hard to tell, what well, does that actually touch the top? And so this is not something that I'll probably give you a slide on an exam and ask you, is this a simple stratified or a pseudo stratified? It's usually going to be obvious, and if it's obvious, it's going to be simple or stratified. So like I said, when we name these epithelial tissues, we give it two words. The first is the number of layers, either simple or stratified. And then the second word is based on shape. And there are three shapes that these cells can be. The first is squamous. Squamous is flat. 
Think about squat. It's short. This is squamous. Cuboidal is cube shaped or circular. It could be spherical. Basically, it's the same dimensions all the way around. And then there is columna, the column shaped. And so we can have a simple squamous <coughs> epithelium, a simple cuboidal epithelium, or a simple columna. Or we can have a stratified squamous, cuboidal, or columna. What we're going to see is if you have stratified, you can have different shapes of cells in here. The name for the shape is going to come off whatever shape the uppermost layer is, the apical surface. And so what we'll see in the skin, the apical surface is very flat <coughs> like that. <coughs> it is a stratified squamous epithelium, but the cells down at the bottom here are going to be cuboidal. But the shape name comes only from the uppermost layer. This is a simple squamous <coughs> epithelium. That's the purple? It's going to be here. So this is the lining of the intestine. So we said that a simple, a simple epithelium is a single <coughs> layer thick because we want something to pass across it easily. And you can probably also imagine it's easier to pass through a cell if the cell is flat versus very tall. Basically, you're trying to get that layer of cells as thin as possible. And a single layer of flat cells is as thin as you can get. And so what it's pointing to is the purple here. It's saying that is the nucleus of a simple squamous cell. <coughs> and so each of these purple dots is the nucleus. And because these cells are so flat, the nucleus takes up almost the entire cell. And so there's only a small amount of space in between the nuclei. We will see this next week. Next week our lab is called the histology lab, and histology is the study of tissues. And so we're going to see slides of all of these. And so when we see the sign of this, it's going to be in the lung. And what you're going to see is kind of a checkerboard pattern. And each of these lines is going to be a single layer of cell. And so, so there's going to be nuclei spread out along the checkerboard. And I think that's going to be easier to visualize than this intestine picture. So, we're going to do one of these slides for each type of tissue. You obviously need to know, based on the name, how many layers there are and what the shape is. But you also <laughs> need to know basic locations of them. Just pick out the major ones. Like If it says it's lining the heart, that's probably a pretty big thing. If they show you a picture of it in the intestine, that's probably an important location to know. You also need to know the basic functions of each one. So describe what it looks like, number of layers and shape, where is it located, and what does it do. Next is simple cuboidal. So simple cuboidal is a single layer of cells, but instead of those cells <coughs> being flat, they are cube shaped. These are in the kidney. So that, I hope, is probably easier to see than that last one was. Mm -hmm. Here we have a single layer of cells lining this open area here. This is where the water from our kidneys are going to go through. And so there's a cell, and there's a cell, and there's a cell, and there's a cell. It's clearly one layer thick. And those cells are basically the same dimensions all the way around. So it is simple cuboidal. These, are most of the time, are going to be found in glands that are going to be secreting or excreting things. So 
they'll also be found where they're going to be absorbed. So parts of our kidney are used to secrete things, parts of our kidney are used to absorb things. So we're going to find a lot of the simple cuboidal epithelium in the kidney. Like the stomach and the bladder, or no? The bladder will, we will, the bladder is an, actually a special type of tissue that we'll see. It doesn't really fall, fall into any of them. The stomach, the stomach's probably not, probably not simple cuboidal. I, don't, I think we'll see stomach someplace else. So simple columnar comes in two subtypes. There are ciliated simple <coughs> columnar and non-ciliated columnar. Do you remember what cilia were? Hair-like things. <coughs> the little hair-like things that I said help to create currents to move things. And so simple columnar epithelia can have them Oh, that's not good. Or they cannot. So this is a non-ciliated simple columnar. So this one, instead of having cilia, has microvilli. This is coming from the lining of the intestine again. And so it's a single layer of cells. All right, they all touch the top and the bottom, and they're very tall and skinny cells. And so it is simple columnar. Mixed in here are these yellow cells. We'll see these again in the lab slide, but these are called goblet cells. <coughs> goblet cells make mucus, and they're almost always found in simple columnar epithelium. So here, these cells are designed to make mucus and then secrete it out into this area here. So this is the lining of the intestine. So it's going to be making mucus and putting a lining of mucus on the outside, or I guess the inside of the intestine. They're called goblet cells because sometimes when they're not really open to the outside, they're really skinny here and then wide down here, and they look like a wine glass upside down. None of these really look like wine glasses. But when you look at the slide next week, you'll see that. You have basically a layer of cells, your simple columnar, and then mixed in there, you'll have something kind of looks like that. So it looks like a wine glass or a goblet upside down. A this is the pseudo-stratified columnar epithelia. It's very, very similar. The only real difference is that the cells aren't uniform, right? Here, all the cells look very similar to each other. In the pseudo-stratified, they don't. They still have the microvilli or the cilia up here, and they also have the goblet cells. Here we have cilia, and so they're going to be used for creating current. So pseudostratified is located places where we need to move things along. The best example is the upper respiratory tract. So if you get <laughs> dust or something in your lungs, you eventually are able to get that out. One of the big reasons we have mucus in our respiratory tract is that things like that get stuck, that they don't end up down in our lungs. So then we slowly move that mucus up, we cough it out, we swallow it, we blow it out our nose, wherever it's gonna go. But we prevented it from getting down into our lungs. So because, again, it is a simple epithelium, we're gonna be allowing things to pass through in a lot of cases. Upper respiratory tract sure certainly is not designed for allowing things to get through. In that case, it's secreting uh, membranes or mucous membranes. The 
simple. We did that. Oh, backwards. <laughs> what did I do? Stratified. Okay. So that's a simple epithelia. Next are the stratified. So here we have multiple layers of cells. So very clearly, we have a lot more layers of cells here than we did here. So this is a stratified epithelium. <coughs> and this is a stratified squamous epithelium. This is usually the epithelium that is going to touch the outside world. So this it can be either the skin or here. This is located in the vagina. So it's going to be touching the outside world. It's also going to be in the digestive tract, the inside of your mouth, your esophagus, things like that. We have multiple layers of cells because it is going to be used for protection. The skin is used for protection. So we need a whole bunch of layers of cells. This is a non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. Keratin is a protein that we can secrete on the surface of our skin. It dries and makes a hard coating. So our skin is keratinized, we say. Our skin looks like this. We have the stratified squamous epithelium here, and then sitting on top is this wavy layer of keratin. We're okay with our skin being a little stiff. It doesn't need to be all that flexible. As long as it doesn't break <coughs> through, that is fine. But something like the inside of our mouth needs to be more flexible. We need to be able to move our mouth to eat, chew, and more importantly, to speak. Because if we don't have good control of our mouth, we can't make good sounds to communicate with each other. So the inside of our mouth is going to be a non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium, like is shown here. We have multiple layers of cells. The top layer is flat. Stratified because we have multiple, squamous because the top layer is flat, and then there is no keratin up here. So the skin, again, we have multiple layers, but then we have extra layer of keratin on top. What was the last one called? They're both stratified squamous. This is keratinized stratified squamous. This one is non-keratinized stratified squamous. Then we have stratified cuboidal. There is not a whole bunch of these in our body. Okay? So stratified cuboidal is multiple layers of cube-shaped cells, and almost all of these are only going to be two layers. You're very rarely going to see something like this, where there's a whole bunch of layers, and they're all cuboidal. You're just not going to. So here we have two layers, but two layers is enough to make it stratified. If we have stratified, and the top layer is cubed, it is a stratified cuboidal epithelium. So here, this is the lining of the esophagus. We're also going to see these are in the ovary. The slide that we're going to look at is in the ovary. So here we see there is one layer, two layers, here, you kind of see the starting of a third, but they're all cube-shaped, and there's clearly multiple layers, and so it's stratified cuboidal. Stratified columnar is multiple layers, and the uppermost layer is columnar-shaped. They're tall and skinny. Here, we're seeing this in things that are going to line some areas where they need to provide some protection. Like in the urethra, but at the same time, they need to secrete something. 
So usually a columnar epithelium is going to be secreting something. And so also like the conjunctiva of the eye. The conjunctiva of the eye is a very, very thin coating over the eye and the inside of the eyelid that's going to secrete some lubrication. And so this is going to be used for protection and secretion. Take a break. Come back at 7 o'clock on that clock. It's about 11 minutes. I was, I was afraid I was going to make the same exact mistake. <laughs> My sweatshirt says Megan right now, so it's kind of tricky. <laughs> so I'll get it. What is this? No, it's not. Do you, uh, when I worked at it, it was, have you ever done that? What is one? I don't really work on two that. I haven't been in there like two years, but. Tonight? Yeah, I used to work there for like three years, but my manager for the longest time loved her. We became like a sister. Her name was Jennifer. Oh, yeah. And I like, have a little bit pissed her off, but you just call her. Oh, like, like, I can understand that, so, like, I'm the guy's chorus, though. Yeah, that's yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, it doesn't bother me, it's just kind of, like, it's, like, so cheesy, like, it's not even funny, like, it doesn't even, like, mirror, like, a laugh, yeah. Like, I'm nothing like her. Okay? Don't work at me. I don't laugh, yeah. I'll never cry, though, like, children. What?
covered different types of epithelial tissue, but we also said that epithelial tissue not only line things, but they make up glands. Glands are one cell or more than one cell that is going to secrete something. And so a gland can be a large thing. A gland can be something a surgeon can go in and remove, but a gland can also be a single cell. That goblet cell that we saw that makes the mucus is a gland. But we also have very large things like thyroid glands in our body that are large tangible things. You can take these glands and break them into two parts or two groups based on where their products go. So a gland is going to make something and secrete it. An endocrine gland is going to take whatever it makes, it's going to put it directly into the bloodstream. And so we have a gland, and then the bloodstream usually flows right through it, and so whatever gets made goes straight into the bloodstream. These are hormones. Endocrine glands make hormones, period. And if you're dealing with hormones, they were made by an endocrine gland. Exocrine glands are going to have a gland, and then they're going to have a duct or a channel that's going to lead to someplace else. And so whatever is going to be made is going to go through that duct and end up someplace else, usually outside of the body, or at least into a cavity that is connected to the outside of the body. So exocrine glands are going to make something that exits the body. Think of things like mucus. Mucus goes in our respiratory tract. That is all touching the outside world. Or sweat. Sweat goes on the outside of our skin. That's touching the outside. The oil on our skin or on our scalp. The earwax, it's all touching the outside. Those are coming from exocrine glands. So that's the end of epithelial tissue. We'll certainly learn a whole lot more about endocrine glands in the endocrine system lecture. And we'll come across all of these different ex exocrine glands as we come across the part of the body that they're located. Like we'll cover sweat glands in the skin next week. So the second type of tissue that we need to talk about today is connective tissue. And the connective tissue is everywhere in our body. All these epithelial tissues that we have are basically held together by connective tissue. And all the muscle tissue and the nervous tissue is held together by connective tissue. And the connective tissue has a whole bunch of different functions. Number one being binding things together. Like I said, it is the glue that holds us together. It's also for support and strength. Our bones are considered connective tissue. It's going to protect and insulate our organs. Fat is a connective tissue. 
So we can use fat as insulation, help keep us warm, but it's also insulation in terms of protection. If we get hit, we won't have an opportunity this semester, but if you get, get a chance to see an eyeball, an eyeball has a whole bunch of fat around it for protection. We're not going to dissect one? No, we don't get anything here to dissect. Nope. You did that in 2085, didn't you? I did. Yeah. There was a bunch, it was hard as a rock. Yeah. Crazy. But, but there, was, there was a bunch of fat on the yes. outside, wasn't there? It was like 90% of it was a fat ball. Yeah, you and had the to, eye was just like stuck to the top. You had to cut through all the fat to figure out where the actual eyeball was, right? A lot of the organs in our body, especially the kidneys, have a lot of fat around them as protection. Connective tissue helps to keep some organs in one place other organs in another place so that we're not just one big floppy bag of organs moving around in our body. Connective tissue is the major transport system in the body because I said we consider blood as a connective tissue. Blood is how things move through our body. Nutrients get from one place in our body to another through the bloodstream. And we said the hormones that come from the endocrine glands are going to go into the bloodstream. And so the connective tissue is going to carry those hormones throughout the body. Connective tissue, because fat is a connective tissue, is the primary energy reserve of our body. We learned about the glycogen in our liver. That's kind of a short-term, quick response level of reserve. It's like the snacks in your pantry as opposed to the canned goods in your storm shelter. Okay? The connective tissue, the fat, is your main energy reserves. And it's also the main immune system site. Because the immune system is white blood cells. And so that is located in the blood, which is connective tissue. All of these connective tissues have two main parts. There are cells, and then there's extracellular matrix. So extracellular means outside of the cell. And the matrix is just everything that's there, whether it be water, whether it be fibers, whatever it may be. It is whatever is outside of those cells. That's extracellular? Extracellular matrix, yes. So the extracellular matrix is what's in between those cells, but the extracellular matrix is usually made up of fibers. So imagine I have some cells, and then outside of these cells are a whole bunch of fibers. You still have a bunch of empty space there, right? The empty space is filled in by jelly called ground substance. Just like inside the cell, the jelly was cytosol, here we have jelly that fills all of the empty space, and that is called ground substance. So the extracellular matrix is going to be the fibers and the ground substance. Cells that are included in the connective tissue have a bunch of different purposes. Number one, in the ones that make up probably 90% of the cells, are called fibroblasts. And they're called fibroblasts because they make fibers. We'll come across the term blasts again later in the bone. Blasts make something. So fibroblasts make fibers. If you have a connective tissue, and I ask you a question, what cells made those fibers? It's fibroblasts. Whether it's collagen or any other type of connective tissue, it's going to be fibroblasts. Also in the connective tissue, you can have macrophages. Macrophages are basically white blood cells, although they don't strictly live inside the bloodstream. Macrophages are little like ninjas that can crawl through other types of tissue 
looking for invaders. So since they're phagocytes, phagocytes are immune cells that eat things. They're going to swallow them up. That's how they're going to kill them. We'll learn our immune system has a lot of different ways to kill invaders, one of which is to just eat them. Plasma cells, we're going to learn, are the, the cells in our immune system that make antibodies. And so, these are in our bloodstream, and so they are part of the connective tissue. Mast cells cause inflammatory responses. So when you injure yourself, and you have inflammation in a joint, or fever, that's a result of mast cells. Mast cells, though, are part of the immune system, in, which is in the blood, and so this is still connective tissue. And then there are adipocytes, which are fat cells. So really, breaking these into three categories, we have immune system cells, we have fibroblasts, which make more structural things, like cartilage, and then we have fat cells at the bottom. So we would be talking about that. All right. So the fibers that our fibroblasts can make come in three types. We have collagen fibers, elastic fibers, and reticular fibers. Collagen is something you hear about fairly frequently. Where do you hear about collagen? Stretch marks. Stretch marks, which are located where? On your body. Where on your body? Like your skin. skin. In like skin cream commercials, they talk about restoring collagen. So collagen is in your skin, and the main purpose of your skin is protection. And so we use collagen there because it is strong, but collagen is also fairly flexible. Because if we had collagen in our skin, the collagen wasn't flexible, it would be like wearing rusty, a rusty suit of armor. You wouldn't be able to move, right? So we need it to be strong, because that's what it's there for, it's for protection, but it also needs to be able to move so that we can move underneath it. Elastic fibers are smaller than collagen. These are made up of protein called elastin. Collagen fibers are made up of collagen protein. Elastic fibers are made of elastin. They're strong, but they're stretchy. They're not designed to be bent, really, like collagen is. They're stretchy, designed to go one direction, like a spring. A spring is designed to go one direction. And they can stretch a lot, about the one and a half times their normal length before they're going to break. Finally, we have reticular fibers, and these are not all that <coughs> common in the body, but they are collagen with an extra coating on them. And so this is for support only. The main site of reticular fibers we'll see is in the spleen. The spleen is an internal organ. It does not need to be able to flex like our skin. And so we add this extra coating of glycoprotein onto it to make it nice and rigid so that it provides a very strong support. Glycoprotein is a protein with sugar on it. Glyco, think glucose, it's a sugar protein. You just take the collagen protein and we stick extra sugars on it. You make a nice coating on it, causes it to be rigid. We can also take our connective tissues and classify them based on how dense they are. We can have loose connective tissues or dense connective tissues. Loose connective tissues are, they have a lot of empty space in them. 
there's a cell here and a cell here and a cell there and some fibers in between them. But most of it, when you look at a picture or on a slide, it looks like empty space. Now, we know it's not actually empty space because what fills that empty space? Oh, this stuff, which was called... It's light side is all, but it's outside the cell. Two words. First word starts with a G. Ground. Ground substance. Yes. So when you look at a picture of these, which we will, you look at them back there, it's going to look like empty space. But remember, it's not. It's just a clear liquid jelly that's filling that. So we have three types of loose connective tissues. We'll talk more in depth about each one. So I won't even mention them here. And then we also have types of dense connective tissue. The first is areolar connective tissue. And this was one of our loose connective tissues. So before I even talk about the words, look at the picture, look at the diagram. There's a lot of empty space, right? When we get to the dense connective tissues, that won't be the case. So areolar connective tissue is a loose connective tissue. There's a whole lot of it in our body. One of the main places we find it is underneath our skin. And so when we look at areolar connective tissue, we're going to see three main things. Okay? You're going to see cells. Again, remember, try to train your eyes. When you look at a slide, find the nuclei. Look for the round dots. Those are your cells. Obviously here, the cells aren't attached one to another to another to another like they were in the epithelial tissue. There's one here, one here, and one here. And then you see these squiggles. Those are the fibers. So these fibers were made by those cells. So what kind of cells are they? Fiberblasts. Fiberblasts. So we have fibroblasts and we have fibers, but you can probably see that there are a couple different types of fibers here. There are large ones, like this, and then there are these little squiggly ones that look like an eyelash on the microscope slide. The big ones are collagen, the small squiggly ones are elastic fibers. So, a number of things you want to look at here. A lot of empty space. We have nuclei, collagen fibers, and elastic fibers. And what can you say about how organized the fibers look? They're not. It's basically willy-nilly here. That is in a, a something, a kind of a definition of areolar connective tissue. So there was nuclei, collagen fibers, and what else? Elastic fibers. When we get to some of the other more dense connective tissues, these fibers are going to be laid down very, very orderly. And so when you look at this and you see they're going all over the place, you're going to immediately know it's a loose connective tissue. And nothing's going to really look like that. Some of the other ones are going to start to look kind of similar, but just it looks like a junk pile. And nothing else is going to look like that. So this is areolar tissue. Because we have collagen, it's flexible and strong. We have elastic tissue, elastic fibers also, though, and so it's kind of stretchy. Together, with strength and elasticity, we're able to provide some support. This is adipose tissue or fat tissue. The correct term is adipose tissue. And we said that the cells, the fat cells, were called adipocytes. This is one of the more misleading cells, or one of the more misleading slides that we're going to see. When you look at that, what does it look like? There's a lot of them. Space. Yeah. It looks like it is empty space between cells. What you're actually seeing is where the fat in each cell is. So these are fat cells. They're designed for storage. 
So remember, look for nuclei. I immediately see nuclei here, 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 and all of these little dots are nuclei. But here's one that we've zoomed in. Here's the nuclei, the nucleus of that cell. This is that whole cell. It's just most of that cell is filled up with fat. But if you take a cell filled with fat and you slice it open to make a microscope slide, you now have empty space because the fat goes away. So in this case, there actually isn't a ton of empty space, but there's also not a ton of cells either. Right? If you count the number of cells here, it's not going to add up to all that much. So it's still considered a loose connective tissue. And so the fat serves a number of purposes. It's insulation for heat, insulation for impact, but it's also our energy reserve. And so, depending on where it's located in our body, it's kind of going to determine which function it has. If it's under our skin, all of our skin has fat underneath it. That's going to be more for insulation. If it's around an organ, like an eye or a kidney, it's going to be for protection. If it's right here, it serves no good purpose other than to store energy. Then how come there's people like that that have so there's, that's a problem of actually accessing the energy. So there's, there's metabolism, which, so metabolism is not going to use all the energy that's available to it. It's going to use how much energy it wants, and if it needs more, it's going to take it from the back. This is that reticular tissue. And so again, this one, there is in fact a whole bunch of empty space. The cells are not closely packed together. The fibers are not neatly organized. We see a lot of white here. And the white is empty space, which would be filled with ground substance. What was your question? There is still a lot of empty space. Yes. I see a lot of white Oh. here. And so the red of the nuclei, but if you're close enough to see, that's a cell, and that's a cell, and that's a cell. That's not cell. All this white, that's just empty space. So it's a loose connective tissue. The reticular fibers are, here they're stained. They're kind of a purple-blue color. And they kind of wind their way through like a meshwork. You see how they're all kind of connected to each other? Mm -hmm. As opposed to the areolar, where it was just a whole bunch of stuff, sticks thro thrown together. Mm -hmm. This seems a little more organized, but it's not really neat looking. These are reticular fibers. The spleen is, is the best example of it. When we see a slide of that, we're going to see the spleen. So this, <laughs> these are our three loose connective tissues. Next week when we see them on the slides, we'll really learn how to train our eyes to tell which one we're looking at. Adipose tissue is easy, right? That's very different than that and that. But we'll learn what to actually look for on our slides to tell that from that. So like we said, the reticular fibers were more rigid than the collagen. They were collagen with extra support. And so this is not going to be flexible like the areolar tissue was. This is a dense connective tissue. You see how there's much more material here than there was on the other ones. It's just there's a lot more pink here than there was color on the other ones. This is a dense, regular connective tissue. And so before I talk too much about that, I want to just show you why it's called a dense, regular connective tissue. This one is a dense, irregular <coughs> connective tissue. Here, everything is lined up in the same direction. Everything is kind of wavy left to right. This one, they're going in all different directions. 
So they look very similar to each other, but this one is kind of scattered. This one is more organized. So this is the dense regular. You're most going to find this in tendons and ligaments. And the reason this is regular, they're all going the same direction, is because tendons and ligaments are designed to stretch one direction. A ligament, a tendon is designed to stretch this way. Think of your Achilles tendon in the back of your heel. It goes one direction, it's designed to stretch up and down. If you try to stretch that sideways, it's going to get painful really quick. And so here, because we have all the fibers running one direction, <coughs> it's going to stretch really, really, really well that direction. But it's only designed to go one direction. Dense irregular has fibers going all different directions. So because the fibers go all different directions, it can stretch in all different directions. It can't go in any one direction a long ways, but it can go in every direction a little bit. And so this is showing it as being in the skin. We don't know what direction our skin is going to have to flex. And so we can't lay the fibers down going one direction. We have to put them every direction and hope that we don't stretch it more than it's capable of stretching. Because if we do, then we're going to start breaking our skin. This is elastic connective tissue. This is a place that's designed for repeated, strong stretching. Stretching a long way. And the best example of that is in the aorta of your heart. So your heart is a pump. Every time it contracts, it pushes a whole bunch of blood out with a bunch of force. And the first thing to receive all of that force is the aorta. And so every time the heart contracts, the aorta kind of has to go like this to absorb some of that shock. So every time your heart beats, your aorta is going like this. And so we need a tissue that is designed to withstand that. Dense regular, dense irregular would not handle that long term. And so we need to have this elastic connective tissue. We also so we see it in our lungs, because our lungs are constantly expanding and contracting. This is the elastic connective tissue. This is zoomed out. You can't really see much there, but when you zoom in, you see these little worms. That is the elastic fibers. There. Okay. So those are the loose and the dense connective tissues. But we also have to cover bone and cartilage. Bone and cartilage are also connective tissues. And cartilage comes in multiple different types. <coughs> cartilage is a very, very dense collection of collagen or elastic fibers. They're both what connective tissues? They're just connective tissue, not loose or dense? Correct. The cells that make cartilage are called chondrocytes. They live, we'll see, in their little homes, their little empty spaces in the collagen. Those spaces are called lacuna. We'll see the same thing in our bone. The cells that make these very, very hard tissues have to create a little space for themselves. And that space is called a lacuna. Cartilage has no blood vessels. Zip, zero, zilch. And so that means that the cells in it, the chondrocytes, get very, very few nutrients. Because they get so few nutrients, they grow very, very, very slowly. So cartilage heals very, very slowly. If you break your nose, it's going to take a long time to heal. If you break a rib, and you will we'll learn there's the bone part of your rib, that will actually heal pretty quickly. But where it attaches to your breastbone is cartilage. If you break that, that's going to heal very, very slowly. 
So if if this is our, our breastbone, and then we have ribs that are connected to it like this, mm -hmm. this part here is cartilage. <coughs> oh, I thought you meant it was surrounding the whole rib. Actually. Wow. There's bone and there's cartilage. If you break the bone, bone is a very much living thing, we'll learn. Surprisingly so. This will heal quickly. If you break the cartilage here, this is not much living. There are very few cells here. And so you're only <laughs> going to have a few cells to repair the damage. So it's going to take them a long time. So like when you get a piercing, too. So like right here. Three uh, if one were to do that, yes. I don't have personal... Well, I'm saying like, well, I'm thinking... Yeah, so I, I can imagine... If you had a piercing in this part of your ear, where it's just skin, basically, I'm guessing that would fill in fairly quickly. Yeah. Whereas if you did it up here in the cartilage, that's probably going to take a long, long time. Yeah, that is <laughs> Yeah, it's too Okay, so chondrocytes, you said that's immature cartilage? Those are the cells that make cartilage. Okay. Chondrocytes make cartilage? Chond chondrocytes make cartilage. So like fibroblasts make fibers, chondroblasts make cartilage. Unfortunately, the names don't match as nicely. We have three types of cartilage. They all have slightly different purposes, and they all look different. We'll talk about each one of these. So what is the lacuna? Lacuna is the little hole that the chondrocytes live in. Let me just... Here. You see these little, they look like bubbles? <coughs> the bubble is a lacuna. So lacuna with an E on the end is plural. Without the E, it's singular. Okay. And then in that bubble, you see a little purple dot, right? Yeah. Purple dots are nuclei, for cells. Okay. So the dots are the chondrocytes living inside a lacuna. Okay. So this is hyalin cartilage. And the term hyaline comes from Greek or Latin, I guess I'm not sure which one it is, but it means glassy. Hyaline cartilage is clear and it looks like glass. If you, where I've seen this really, is if you ever buy a whole chicken and you take it apart, or a turkey, you see some, some collagen in there, it's just clear. It looks like clear plastic, basically. That is hyaline cartilage. Best example of this is your nose. That clear thing would then on the skeleton that? That I don't want I don't I don't want to give any wrong answer. Yes. Yes, <coughs> correct. Anterior ends of ribs. Is hyaline cartilage. So it's clear like that. Thank you. So this is smooth. It's also flexible. And so, being smooth on our nose is not all that important. I mean, it's under the skin, it doesn't rub on anything. So the fact that it's smooth isn't important there. Would it make but it, bumpy? it would, <laughs> but that doesn't, why is that a bad thing? If we all had lumpy noses, you wouldn't think twice about it. So, well, the reason we have hyaline cartilage in our nose is because hyaline cartilage is flexible. I can go like this, and it's not breaking. If I move the upper part of my nose where it's bone that much, it's going to break. <laughs> and so hyaline cartilage is smooth and flexible. Hyaline cartilage also is in our joints. Imagine you have, well, stop drawing and keep going back to my skull. I have this, this joint. It's moving here, right? These bones here, <coughs> it's not on here, but we'll learn it's there, is cartilage. It's like lubrication there. It doesn't really matter that it's flexible. It's not going to bend here. You were twisting his arm all the time for me. He's not complaining. <laughs> <laughs> but it is important here that it's smooth. Because if it was rough, 
Those are not going to slide on each other well. Like arthritis? So arthritis is actually a loss of the hyaline cartilage. That's and so true. then you have the bone rubbing on bone. And bone is not smooth. And so the hyaline cartilage is a smooth coating on the bone that allows it to move nicely. Arthritis is uh, genetic, right? There are different types of arthritis. <laughs> and so something like rheumatoid arthritis where your immune system, it's an autoimmune disease, it actually attacks the joint, that is a lot of times genetic. But if you are someone who gets a lot of injuries in a joint, you just destroy the heck out of your joint, you get arthritis there also. But that's not genetic. Unless, you're, unless your, gene, your genes made you a daredevil and that caused your So that's hyaline cartilage. Next is fibrocartilage. Fibrocartilage is strong. It is somewhat flexible. It's, there's a little bit of flex there, but it is more about being strong. And it is not <coughs> glossy. It is kind of a milky white color. So here, compare this to that. It's a little bit darker. I think on an actual person you would see there's a bigger difference in color. We'll learn about how to tell these apart on slides next week, but immediately you should be able to see, well that looks very different than that. Yeah. And if you see hyaline cartilage, it's always going to look like that with those bubbles. It looks very bubbly to me. This you're going to see in main, mainly in two places between the vertebra and your spine, and also in what's called the pubic symphysis. So we see it here, we also see it right here. So these are locations where they're not designed to flex a lot, but they do flex some. Every time we walk and we change the weight that's going onto our pelvis, this pubic symphysis is stretching a little bit. And every time we bend our spine, this cartilage is having to bend a little bit. The final type is elastic cartilage. And again, this looks very different than that, which looks very different than that. This is some place that is going to be very, very flexible, but strength doesn't really matter. The upper part of my ear is a good example of that. It needs to be very, very flexible, otherwise the first time I bump my ear, it's going to break. And every time I roll over on my pillow, I'm going to snap my ear. Right? So, it needs to be very flexible. But as long as it's rigid enough to hold itself up and it doesn't flop over like a dog, then it's strong enough. It doesn't need to bear weight. I guess if you put a giant stud, that, if you were rigid and you put like a five carat diamond stud up here, it might flop over, but at that point it's so, you're so rich that nobody's going to care, right? <laughs> so this is elastic cartilage. It's very flexible, but not strong. Bones are also connective tissue. Bones will have the entire skeletal system lecture on, so we're not going to talk too much about bones today, but again, I will point out that bones <coughs> are surprisingly active places. It's very easy to think about bone as basically a rock. Mm -hmm. It's designed to sit there and do nothing but provide support. But there's a lot of cells, a lot of blood vessels, a lot of nerves. It's a very, very living place. The bone is going to support soft tissue. I mean, I can't lift my arm if there's no rigid bone in there. The soft tissue would be the skin and the muscle. It's going to provide protection. I've got the ribs in my skull to protect delicate things. And it's going to be used for movement. The bone mineral is mostly calcium and phosphorus. The calcium and phosphorus are very, very important for a lot of things in our body. And so, yes, it's important for it to be in the bone, so that the bone is hard, but the bones can act like a bank. We can store extra calcium and phosphorus in our bones, and if something else in our body needs that, 
we can take it out. So if we have something in our body, let's say our brain, we don't, we're not getting enough calcium in our diet, our brain is calcium deficient. It's more important for me to have a functioning brain than it is to have a strong bone. And so I'm going to sacrifice my bone strength to make sure my brain continues working. Inside of our bones, our bone marrow. The bone marrow is where our blood cells are made. Our white blood cells, our red blood cells. <coughs> and we also have something called yellow bone <coughs> marrow, which is an extra site for fat storage. Blood, we've said a number of times, is considered a connective tissue. It's kind of confusing, though, because the ground substance, or sorry, the extracellular matrix is liquid. It is not fibers, it is not hard, it, this is not connecting anything, it's not supporting anything. But we consider blood as a connective tissue. Same thing with lymph. We'll learn that lymph is kind of rogue blood that got out of the bloodstream. It's just water, basically. But we consider them liquid connective tissues where the extracellular matrix is liquid, which is water. In our blood, that water is our plasma. So that is the extracellular matrix. We also have a number of membranes in our body. A membrane is just a general term for a tissue that is covering <coughs> part of a body. And so we have three different types. First is mucous membrane. If you can picture a part of your body that has mucus, that's a mucous membrane. Okay? So in our lungs, in our mouth, anything like that. So this is going to directly contact the outside world. We're not going to have mucous membranes any place that does not directly contact the outside world. So we're talking the digestive tract, the respiratory tract, and the reproductive system. Those are lined by mucous membranes. We already learned about serous membranes, right? We had the pericardial membrane, the pleura, and the peritoneum. They line body cavities. Serous membranes do not touch the outside world. They line cavities of our body that are purely inside. Mucous membranes touch the outside. Serous membranes stay inside only. And then there are synovial <coughs> membranes that are only on certain joints. We'll learn that there are something there is something called a synovial joint. What you think of as a normal joint is a synovial joint. And actually on this joint there's going to be a little basically water balloon that keeps liquid in here to keep it lubricated. So that little water balloon around that joint is going to be a synovial membrane. And that's what like cracks, like you crack your joints. That is the idea, joint. yes. They say that is what causes it. They don't really know that. It's like your hip would have a lot of that. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, if you have a joint that is freely movable, it's going to have one. The other types of joints that don't have that, you probably wouldn't immediately think of as a joint. Like that pubic symphysis. Right. So here's our mucous membrane with our goblet cells. Here's a serous membrane around our lungs, the skin, and synovial membrane around a joint. So we have synovial membrane here and here, keeping some liquid lubrication in here. Last couple, slides, last couple slides, muscular and nervous tissue. Big types of tissue, lots of information, but they have their own lecture, so we each only have one slide today. Muscular tissue is long cells that are designed to contract. And when they contract, they pull everything around them together. So that allows us to move our muscles and move our bones. They generate force. <coughs> we learn 
your skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, smooth muscle. Skeletal muscle is what you think of as muscle. It's attached to your bones, it helps us move. Cardiac muscle is easy, that is your heart. Your heart is mostly cardiac muscle. Cardiac muscle is found nowhere other than in the heart. And then there is smooth muscle. If you can think of a hollow organ, like we named earlier, it probably has smooth muscle. It's designed to take something that's hollow and make it smaller, to push whatever is in there out. So whether that be the stomach, the intestines, Smooth muscles also in your blood vessels. Your blood vessels have to constantly expand and contract to control your blood pressure. We'll learn how that works. But that smooth muscle that changes the volume and size of your blood vessels by contracting and relaxing. Finally, the nervous tissue. There's two types of cells in nervous tissue. The nervous tissue is the most complicated of all of them but there's only two cell types. There are the neurons, which are the functional cells. They are the stars of the show. They are the ones that conduct the electricity. They are the ones that send the signals. The other cells are called neuroglia. They are the helper cells of the neurons. It's like a professional athlete with a whole bunch of different trainers that help that athlete perform at their best, okay? For every one neuron, there could be hundreds or thousands of neuroglia. When you look at that neuron slide back here today, you're gonna see the neuron, but I want you to look at the rest of the slide. You're gonna see a whole bunch of little purple dots, which are nuclei. All those other little purple dots are the neuroglia. Are they small? They're very small. They're much smaller than the neuron. Okay. Yeah. So the neuron will be big and obvious. All the other little dots, you'll barely even see the cell. You'll just see a dot here, here, and here. Those are the neuroglia. Okay. Let's take a break. We'll officially start at 8 o'clock on that clock, which is almost 15. The slides are set up here, though. And so if you want to get started looking at the slides, you're more than welcome to do that.